Hello, everyone. My name is Chita. We are pleased that you could join us for this week's lecture in volume nine of uh, the No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists, including standing members of the No Neuropsychology Board, as well as members of the No Neuropsychology Committee. Before we start our lecture, one of the main goals of No Neuropsychology is to provide free, high quality didactic content to our audience. Every No Neuropsychology lecture is available on our YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures to get first access to our new content. New to Neur No Neuropsychology is our collaboration with Absent to bring you learning and discussion questions that are provided with specific lectures content. You can access these on our website and through Absent. Here are the disclaimers for the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen, and the recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and YouTube channel later this week. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jimmy Choi for today's lecture titled Neuropsychology of Schizophrenia. Dr. Choi is the research director at Hartford Healthcare in Connecticut. He directs the cognitive rehabilitation services in the hospital network that provides clinical assessment and treatments to adolescents and adults with psychosis. For the past 20 years, he has conducted studies at Yale and Columbia University, where he was on the research and clinical faculty, focusing on the areas of treatment motivation and psychosocial rehabilitation in psychosis and Alzheimer's diseases. He is co-editor of the book, Neuropsychology of Depression by Guilford Press. He has received funding from NIH, the Alzheimer's Association, the Department of Veteran Affairs, and the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. In particular to the talk today, he is currently leading a NIMH-funded study in addressing cognitive and social function in adolescents and adults with early psychosis. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Choi. Now I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. That was quite an introduction. Thank you. And uh, it was a pleasure to be here today. And I was just joking with other people in the beginning when, before we started that I feel kind of old because it's, you know, talking to the, the young ones and the trainees and those in their early career. And, and I get to be on YouTube for the first time. This is going to be on YouTube? Yay! I've always wanted to be on YouTube. You know, it was, uh, we are thinking about what to, uh, to talk about for those actually to those who are you know starting their career or uh, or embark on their career and we want to kind of be able to tell you that there are what's going on in terms of the field of neuropsychology in terms of schizophrenia today and give you all the latest information and uh, all at the same time kind of what 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 things that you might encounter uh, in terms of actually what you're going to be uh, facing when you do testing or do, trying to do treatment uh, with people with schizophrenia. So I decided, well, let's talk about the the beginning, uh, the underpinnings, the neurobiological, the neuropsychological mechanisms that might be playing a role in all the things that you'll be encountering. So the, the, the study is actually broken up uh, into two parts where we talk about the, the underpinnings of schizophrenia. And then later on, we'll talk about how that will uh, will impact uh, your work uh, when you're working with people with schizophrenia. Okay, doke. So let's go ahead right now and get started. Okay. Oh, by the way, there's so there's no financial conflict of information <laughs> as we talked about. But as Eric Granholm at University of California San Diego used to say, he has no financial conflicts of no financial conflicts, but he's open to it. <laughs> and that's going to be my line too. No financial conflicts, but I wish there was some. 
So here we go. So when we talk about the underpinnings of schizophrenia, we talk, we start out in 2003. And Tara Nindo uh, had this seminal study where she looked at uh, pairs of those actually at seven years old and later on as adults, and those who developed schizophrenia and those who did not. And when you go back all the way to their testing when they were seven years old, we found out that the only thing that separated them uh, on a neuropsychological battery uh, was digits and coding, a test of processing speed. And at this time, there was a lot of talk about the information processing speed model and how that plays a role uh, in terms of the development of schizophrenia. So the, the information processing is one of those core uh, neuropsychological functions that if it gets congested, it, it, it can impact things way down downstream. So that, that's what this theory is about, is that uh, schizophrenia seems like there's a lot of congestion going on in terms of processing speed, whether it has to do with conversations, social cues, trying to take in all the things into the environment. And processing speed has come out, and the, the theory has held up uh, very well in the last 20 years. That it is one of the core deficits that either lead to or actually impact many different areas in terms of schizophrenia. So this bottom-up information processing speed hypothesis, again, upstream to very real-world abilities. And when this happens, actually, the brain, uh, it has to work much harder. And it's interesting when you look at the fMRI studies in schizophrenia, where some of the areas you think, hmm, you, they have a lot of cognitive deficits, and you're thinking, well, there probably won't be a lot of oxygenation or a lot of hemodynamic responses in that area. What you see is actually the opposite. You see these massive hemodynamic responses in regions of the brain, showing that the brain is not just working hard, it's working extra hard, actually too hard to do some simple cognitive tasks. And this comes at a cost. When the brain is working that hard, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of effort. And a lot of people with schizophrenia, they always talk about how tired they are, how exhausted they are. And that's because the brain is working extra hard to process normal signals that are coming in. And it can't make sense of it. There's, 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 there's the bottleneck, it's trying to put information together and it's having a hard time doing that. And one of the things that you always hear when you work with people is to point is they feel like they're, a, um, hey, I'm a step behind it. I don't like mingling or meeting with other people or talking to other people because I'm, I'm, I'm missing things. I feel like they're talking about something and I'm always a step behind in whatever they're talking about. And that leads to actually them being more socially isolated. So you see how actually information processing, processing speed model can impact actually what they're doing actually in their everyday life. Let's take a little step back though. So what might be the reason for this? What might be causing this? Let me introduce to you, this is actually considered the schizophrenia skyline in the genetic field. And it, it doesn't take a, a, a genetist to see, wow, something's going on with chromosome six. And so chromosome six, there's a component called C4. And in chromosome six, C4 is responsible for, for neural pruning. And neural pruning, uh, Neuro pruning is responsible for the coupling that happens in our brain. Coupling is uh, how your brain, the neurons fire and sync, and the pattern uh, of neural activity. And that coupling is a response of neuro pruning. Uh, and as we know, when we start out, we don't have a lot of brain cells, right? We start off at birth, no brain cells. And over the period of the first five, six years of life, there's a massive explosion of neural growth connections. What happens during those first five, six years? You learn to walk, you learn to talk. In many cultures, that's the time where you start school, right? So the brain has actually developed all these connections because your brain is learning every second. And you can tell when you look at a baby that young, they're just like absorbing all this information and their brain is just making all these connections. Strangely, as you get into your teenage years, though, and this is very important, 
the brain starts cutting away at these neural connections. And all this time that you've developed actually and all this uh, mental effort and neural energy that you spend creating these uh, connections are actually pruned away. Pruned away because to make the brain more efficient. If you don't use those connections anymore, you lose it. For example, when I was growing up, I used to be able to speak Korean, my native language. Came to the US very young, I stopped speaking Korean. Lo and behold, my brain actually <laughs> pruned all those neural connections that were responsible for me knowing Korean. And by the time I was a teenager, I didn't know how to speak Korean anymore, except for all the swear words. You, you always remember how to do the curse words. However, so in neural pruning, that's supposed to happen, it can go haywire. So sometimes it can prune too much, or sometimes not enough. This neural pruning is directly responsible for the symptoms and actually the progression of schizophrenia in uh, teenagers to young adulthood. And you can see this actually in the neural network models and the studies that have done comparing the connectivity, the neural connections, the strength of the neural connections, the amount of neural connections between different areas and regions of the brain. You can definitely see how actually the, the pruning has become erratic, uh, inefficient, and the, the coupling is off. And especially so, and for example, there's a syndrome in schizophrenia called disorganized syndrome. And that's where actually the symptoms are much more severe. And comparing that with healthy control, those who don't have schizophrenia versus those who have schizophrenia, and those who have one of the more severe forms of schizophrenia, you can definitely see how information processing speed and the coupling that is off, the inefficient neural pruning that happens and how that leads to congestion uh, in the neural networks. So remember this diagram, the seminal study by Terrell from 2003, which showed digit span, the statistical separation in digit span. This was actually at seven years old, seven years old. Interesting. So let's say this decline, this processing speed, whatever is happening, it's happening very early. And that led to the question, well, schizophrenia usually is diagnosed in young adults at 19, 20, 21, early 20s. And people thought, well, that was the beginning of schizophrenia. So but the question became actually in a, uh, where they asked, well, is it is that the beginning or is actually more the end? And Robin Murray even actually proposed this in 1987. Is schizophrenia more of a development, neurodevelopmental disorder? And Judith Rappaport at NIMH has actually led the charge in helping us understand that schizophrenia is not the beginning. It is actually the end state of an abnormal neurodevelopmental process. The pathogenesis begins very early, as we saw in Tara Nindam's 2003 paper, The Age of Seven. It begins early, and it points to a time in adolescence where there actually is a very high risk state of developing schizophrenia that actually has a lot of measurable changes. The, the way to show this is that the um, naturalistic studies one of the one of the uh, the drawbacks and weaknesses of many of those who work in hospitals is that we see the uh, the help seeking population, those who come to the hospital, and um, by that time you don't really get a good idea of really what happened before. Uh, it's basically just on what they say went on, and usually what happens is that oh, the my son or uh, my brother. Just in the last couple of months, they started to hear things. They started to uh, be by, wanted to be by themselves. They started to get very paranoid just as in the last month. And usually that's not very accurate. It happened a long time before. So it took naturalistic studies where people were not coming to the hospital, but they studied them who were experiencing psychosis, but for some reason or, or, or uh, reasons unknown, or sometimes they just flat out said they didn't want to go to the hospital. We were able to do naturalistic studies of people who were, never came into the hospital 
from actually an early, late adolescence to early adulthood. And the studies show it starts early as 12 years old, the symptoms start to emerge. You have the processing deficits that start even a little bit before that. So the symptoms really start to emerge as early as 12 years old, and that there is a prodrome period. There is a period where there is a risk state, where there are actually measurable changes in symptoms that get in the way of daily life. And social function happens to be one of them. As we talked about with the bottleneck hypothesis, you hear that all the time with adolescents or during this phase. Again, they they don't hang around with their friends anymore because they feel like they're missing out. People are talking too fast. Things are moving too fast for them. And the negative symptoms start to emerge. And we'll talk a little bit about this, the A motivation circuitry that plays its role, plays a very significant role in how schizophrenia emerges and the presentation and one of the most important areas to try to address. And mild psychosis starts to appear. So there is that prodrome period starting in adolescence where you can see the changes and more importantly, where you can try to make some kind of intervention, or you can uh, or you can do something to help actually mitigate that trajectory. If there's one thing I hope that uh, people here take away from the talk today, um, is that there is a clinical high risk stage before the first full onset of psychosis, and it's a very it's just a switch in the way that schizophrenia is, is being viewed now. More and more clinics are popping up all over the country to target this prodrome period. And uh, it, the DSM-5, for the first time, just the DSM-5 and the DSM, they acknowledge that there is an attenuated psychosis period. And later on, hopefully, they will be able to introduce other stages of the prodrome period. For example, something called brief, limited, intermittent psychotic symptoms is when the tenure of psychosis starts to get worse and worse. And usually what happens is the symptoms actually become so severe that they do end up coming to the hospital. And that plays a role in how all this, this prodrome will face, which lasts about seven years, transitions into the first downright psychotic episode where they're diagnosed with schizophrenia. So if there's one thing I hope you take away from this is that the field now knows that there is a, uh, a prodrome period before schizophrenia where interventions might be more impactful. Very similar to uh, the uh, NCD field the neurocognitive disorder, the dementia field. As we now know, uh, we've known actually for quite some time that there is a mild cognitive impairment phase where actually you can intervene and hopefully mitigate the trajectory to dementia. Uh, the same thing with schizophrenia. And what we'll be doing about it is that, let me introduce to you the most expensive, the most, the largest mental health project uh, that's ever been funded in the history of psychiatry and mental health research. It, the Accelerating Medicine Partnership uh, that's, uh, that was uh, spearheaded by NMH is charging ahead and, and with partners from all over the world, pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, biomedical companies, the European medicine agencies, the, the FDA, and NAMI National got in involved. And what we're doing is a, a series of hospitals from all over the world are networking as an international consortium to study this prodrome phase, to understand it. The battery that we are using, it's called the kitchen sink battery for a reason. The whole battery lasts like eight, nine, 10 hours. So every type of fMRI, EEG, uh, family assessment, social assessment, and trying to understand this prodrome period, and not only understand it, what the biomarkers may be, but to hopefully to mute those biomarkers so that you can actually treat. And hopefully the, the goal is to be able to one day to cure schizophrenia, to be able to stop the progression from prodrome to the first onset schizophrenia. So it has been fascinating to be involved in this project. And uh, this project started in 2020. 
And so I don't know if you know, that was right <laughs> during the pandemic. And uh, never start an international consortium study during the international pandemic. Uh, that, that was tough, but the, the leaders, Scott Woods, Kerry Bearden, and John Kane, that led us through, and we are now collecting data. And hopefully, the, as much information as we're getting right away, we're converting that into uh, data that we can use to convert for treatments, gene therapy, compounds, a new type of psychosocial rehabilitation methods. So that's that's the underpinnings. That's that's the that's what's going on when you're working with schizophrenia. That's what was happening to them when you're sitting across the, the table for them. This is probably what they went through. And this model of information processing speed, the neurodevelopmental model, uh, the, the, it's it's it, the data on it has held. So the last twenty years, it's still the model that we refer to. So it, it seems like actually it's here to stay, and that has an, an impact on what actually will happen when you yourself work with people with schizophrenia. And we're going to let's go right into that in the areas that may impact when you do assessments and treatment and uh, working with people with schizophrenia. For, first up, negative symptoms. And those of you who work with people with schizophrenia know negative symptoms. Uh, that, that is the what. And when you're testing people with schizophrenia, and a lot of times uh, you, you will see that your your battery, the test results sometimes don't really link up with actual functioning. And it's because the what are you measuring? And it happens to be you're measuring cognitive ability, but there is something that's actually even more important. Uh, the international organizations, many of them don't even include or don't even recommend Neuropsycholo neuropsychological testing for schizophrenia. I know, I know people, I share your outrage, and I know INS, NAN, Division 40, but there are many international organizations that don't recommend it because they want you to focus on negative symptoms. And negative symptoms, negative symptoms account for world functioning regardless of cognitive ability whether it intake or changes in cognition, it's really about the negative symptoms. And this, especially these three, it's called the A motivation circuitry. Uh, there's a phenomenological overlap, abolition, anhedonia, uh, but they're all connected. And they seem to be actually the central to all the negative symptoms that we see here. And the important thing is when you're working with people with schizophrenia to be able to capture this because it will impact not only testing but treatment the the circuitry the neuropsychological understanding of it uh, is, it doesn't have to do with discrete regions of the brain but actually a, a network so there's a disruption actually in the network uh, that has to do with reward processing motivation intrinsic motivation and effort-based decision-making. Reward processing, starting right there, it's about hedonic experience. It's about your ability, my ability, to be able to enjoy something. When you work with people with schizophrenia, it's amazing uh, they hear, and you know, they'll talk about, I used to really like doing this. I used to really like going for a run. I used to really like cooking. I used to really like hearing about this topic or studying this topic, but they lose that, they, the, just the enjoyment of it. And not only do they lose the enjoyment, the experience of it, anticipatory, they, they don't think that they will enjoy it if they do it again in the future. So that experience of a, experiencing pleasure is not only muted in what they experience, but in terms of what they think they will experience in the future if they do it again. And that leads to actually not being very internally motivated, not being very intrinsically motivated to do anything, whether it's a general state, a lack of motivation, just a blah, just a general blah of not wanting to do anything, and or very task-specific, 
They don't want to do something, for example, uh, work on a certain uh, task that you give them, uh, go to a certain program for treatment. So this hedonic or ahedonia actually influences their experiences of intrinsic internal motivation and drive to want to be able to do anything. And it's not very far-fetched where you hear uh, people say, sometimes they just spend all their day in the room staring at the screen or just staring at the wall. That kind of, that kind of severity in terms of the lack of pleasure, lack of hedonia, the lack of internal motivation and drive. And what this does sometimes and when they're trying to make a decision about whether to do something, effort-based decision-making, that's where you kind of weigh the, uh, the pros and cons of whether you want to do something. How much effort will this take and will it actually lead to the outcome that I want? And this can be, uh, you can clearly see this in studies. And I'm gonna uh, share with you, uh, quickly share with you a study that I did for uh, exercise, helping people with schizophrenia do more exercise because of the metabolic syndrome that can occur in schizophrenia. Not sure because of the antipsychotic medications, but because of schizophrenia in general. It, 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 the, the hits just keep on coming for people with schizophrenia. They, they get hit every which way in terms of their um, neural circuitry. The, the body actually starts to uh, 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 have these experiences, the, the diabetes, uh, it, and it, the mortality rate for people with schizophrenia is incredibly high. Uh, they, they, they die about, about, about 10 to 15 years earlier than people without schizophrenia. And a lot of it has to do with because of this metabolic syndrome. And so exercise, people in the field have been trying to get people with schizophrenia to exercise, to, to eat healthier. So did the study where we had a person work on the treadmill for five minutes, any speed on the treadmill, any speed, five minutes, and you get paid $10, All right? Five minutes, $10. However, you can do 10 minutes, $20. Oh, twice as much, twice as much time, twice as much exercise, twice as much payment. Oh, okay. Or they can do 11 minutes. So this is just one more minute up and get paid a ridiculous, a sounding $50. Five minutes, $5, 10 minutes, $10, 11 minutes, $50. We're all going to do the 11 minutes for $50, right? It's, the amount of effort is minimal, and the outcome is much more. Many people with schizophrenia have trouble making this decision. And this goes back, this goes back actually to the information processing speed bottleneck that we talked about. They have trouble actually comparing the effort and the outcome. So instead of deciding whether to do it, what happens? They don't decide at all. And that's where evolution comes in, the lack of actually uh, any kind of movement toward goal-directed activity. And the reason why we focus so much, again, on uh, motivation and negative symptoms is because addressing this seems to actually make a difference in the whole constellation of negative symptoms, including cognition, actually. So this is really the area that people focus on. And that's the reason why many organizations actually don't really emphasize cognitive or neuropsychological testing, but more about assessing uh, negative symptoms. Because if you can tackle this and if you can address it and improve it, 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 it pretty much improves almost every area uh, of that person's life. And the strongest mediator and moderator of treatment and assessment success is schizophrenia, hands down, is this a motivation circuitry. So if you can, in your battery, uh, including the uh, measure of negative symptoms is important. And, and I know, and I know um, neuropsych, neuropsych batteries are long as it is, I know. But there, there are newer ones out. So the gold standard has been, always been the positive and negative symptom scale, the PANS. It's been around for 35 years. A lot of information data is considered the gold standard. There are newer ones that, uh, that, are, uh, that are brief. 
uh, still building up the uh, empirical data on it, but very solid. Uh, and I recommend actually, if you can, in making sure that you include, uh, when you're working with people with schizophrenia, uh, an assessment for negative symptoms, and the Keynes would be perfect for that. It's brief, and it actually focuses on this A motivation circuitry that we talked about. So the what you are measuring, you gotta be careful, the what you are measuring, negative symptoms, but not just the what, the when. The other reason why the neuropsych batteries that you do might not really align with how they're actually doing in the real world is when are you measuring? And that has to do with IV. And this is just kind of an example of when you do to repeat testing with somebody over a period of time, you'll see some fluctuations, of course. Maybe they were tired that day. Uh, maybe they didn't have enough coffee or something like that. But that fluctuations will be in a normal, it'll, it'll be within a normal range, within 0.5 standard deviations, right? In schizophrenia, it goes way up and down. And actually, this is a, a, an actual performance of somebody actually with schizophrenia uh, that I've worked with. And you can see, depending on when you test them, the overall cognitive performance will vary uh, tremendously. Even, even, and you're thinking, well, what well, it could be the symptoms, it could be because they're depressed, because we all know how much depression impacts uh, negative symptoms, I mean, how much depression impacts uh, cognitive performance. But this is even when the depression and the psychotic symptoms remain about the same and there's no changes in medication. And this RIV that happens, this, this is a significant variability neuropsychologically, behaviorally, physio physiologically, it goes back to that, that neural inefficiency that we talked about, the neural pruning where the coupling is off, um, with that bottleneck hypothesis. And you, it's, it's this dispersion, actually, you can see it get worse and worse as schizophrenia starts to approach in late adolescence and early adulthood. There is greater IIV as schizophrenia progresses. And this is a, a good example, a 15 year old that I work with, clinical high risk for, for schizophrenia, no changes in depression or no significant changes in depression or psychosis, no changes in medication. You can see how the variability in their testing in each domain gets larger and larger over a period of time. And not just in that individual, but actually as a group. So when you look at a group of, uh, uh, of 144 uh, uh, adolescents with clinical high risk, you can also see it as a group. That variability gets larger and larger over a period of as schizophrenia progresses and they get more, more and more at risk for the, that first outright psychotic episode. So not just the what and the when, but the how. So how are you measuring, all right? So, and I'm gonna just go, go right into this because uh, this, this, is, this is one of those things where you learn and you learn a certain way of doing something your whole career and then all of a sudden it's just mind blown. So we use reading as an estimate of pre IQ many times, right? So uh, people have found, the researchers have found out that actually there is a reason for this, for reason for people with schizophrenia having impaired reading that has nothing to do with their pre-morbid IQ. And you can see this in terms of the scan path. It's about how they read the visual scanning deficit that occur. Uh, and I told you that the heat, just, the hits just keep on coming. And for people with schizophrenia, and if you ever sat down with them, and I remember leading groups where we would all go around uh, reading certain passages uh, from a cognitive training manual, sort of like class, right? Let's have go around and let's have everybody read a certain passage. It's amazed that a lot of times they struggled with reading. And I remember thinking, this person graduated from college where this person actually graduated from high school. So now we know, thanks to Daniel Javit, Pam Butler, and Nadine Remingham, actually at the Nathan Klein Institute, who have been doing this research for the last 15 years, 
that people with schizophrenia, they develop an acquired dile uh, dyslexia. There is normal reading development. So reading develops normally th uh, throughout their adolescence, right? But at the time of where the first full-blown psychotic episode happens, reading ability starts to decline. And usually it's about three to four years below pre-morbid IQ based on other non-reading tests and education level. Right now it's about based on the latest research, the reading level is about 3.4 years below the pre-morbid IQ estimates. So what you're getting when you do a reading test is really not an accurate representation of their pre-morbid IQ. Because of the ocular motor, the phonological processing issues that happen in schizophrenia, and as I said, the heat, the hits just keep on coming for 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 people with schizophrenia. And so the, now we know that they have a visual sensory problems that interfere with their reading, and it doesn't have nothing to do with their reading. The good news is, is there is some research to suggest that one word reading might be an attack uh, at at times. So the, the, for example, using the rat might be better than using the other types of reading fluency tests. But the, the research is equivocal on that. You just bear in mind that when you're doing pre-mobile IQ estimates, if, if you're using reading, it might not be an accurate measure. And lastly, this, this talk, if probably if somebody does it again in a couple of years, won't be called the neuropsychology of schizophrenia. It'll be called the neuropsychology of biotypes because there is a paradigm shift going on, uh, you know, uh, not just in schizophrenia either. Actually, throughout all of, of psychiatry, there is an integration of psychiatry and neuroscience. And if you ever hear of the RDOC, it's a, a, a NIMH initiative, uh, the RDOC, the research uh, domain criteria, is that it, what it does is that, okay, these our understanding of, uh, of these conditions is based on the DSM and, and that category. There are studies going on right now to reconceptualize that based on actually the neuropsychological and the neurophysiological understanding of these conditions rather than the DSM diagnostic category. In a schizophrenia, it's spearheaded uh, by these PIs who are part of the bipolar schizophrenia network Inter intermediate phenotyping. And since 2009, they have been doing dense phenotyping for people who have a lifetime history of schizophrenia, uh, the, their family, and healthy controls. And we've come to understand that maybe it's not about this diagnostic category. So you take all of them, and instead of using these diagnostic categories, you use actually neuroscience markers and break them into actually separate types of pro biotypes or probands. And what this does is that, that, that shift that I was talking to you about, instead of uh, working with people with schizophrenia, you, you anybody who's actually worked in, uh, done group therapy or any kind of uh, group treatment for people with schizophrenia in a, in a schizophrenia program, and I'm talking to you, do you, aren't you amazed at the diversity in, in cognitive ability and symptoms and within that small group or within that large group? Sometimes you're thinking, does this person really have schizophrenia? Other times you're thinking, wow, this person has something maybe even worse than schizophrenia. There is so much diversity within that group in terms of symptoms, performance, Sometimes you have to wonder, again, whether some people were misdiagnosed. It can be, or it can be that our conceptualization of schizophrenia based on the DSM is really not a good way to actually categorize uh, this whole spectrum of psychosis. Instead, using biomarkers and neurophysiological actually parameters uh, of neuroreactivity processing field, like we mentioned, negative symptoms and, and fMRI, and we can actually put people into separate probands, not just actually to identify different people and their abilities, but actually for treatment purposes, so that we can actually tailor the intervention specifically for what's going on with them, neurobiologically and neuropsychologically, 
rather than using the DSM category. And that's the summary for today. So the neurodevelopmental processes and bottleneck models can shed light on the etiology. There exists a prodrome period. I really want you to hopefully you can take that away. I mean, there is a period of time before schizophrenia where changes and interventions might be more impactful. Try to add in negative symptoms to your overall battery. Keep in mind about the uh, IIV that occurs and the acquired dyslexia that may, that will impact your neuropsych testing. And there's a whole way of reconceptualizing the diagnostic categories of schizophrenia uh, in the next couple of years. We might even be dropping the term schizophrenia altogether. Okay, so I'm going to pause there and leave it up for actually any questions that might come up. And I see that one question that came up. Is there QI? Is, there, is, there, is that one question that you might want me to tackle? Yeah, yes, we, we do have a question coming in. And yeah, feel free to go ahead, Dr. Choi. Sure. So there's one from an anonymous attendee. Is there any study that involves white matter reduction? Oh, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say this. A caveat is I am not an fMRI researcher. I, I will say this, uh, uh, but there are studies that show white matter reduction as well. So the training, the fMRI studies and the MRI studies of schizophrenia has really focused on the gray matter. There are some interventions that have been found actually to increase gray matter in schizophrenia, but. Again, making that distinction between white matter and gray matter, though, there is something actually to be more said about actually targeting treatments, whether you can address the amount of neural connections in white matter, because as we know, processing speed is more of a white matter aspect. Uh, uh, but again, I'm not, that might be a little bit beyond uh, my area of expertise, but uh, there are studies, and I'm happy actually to point them out to you. And... Uh, but again, what, uh, and while I say this though, the it's not matter of white matter and gray matter anymore. And that's actually, that's the other thing that's changing the paradigm shift. It's more about the connectivity. And I know the white matter plays a role now. And I thank you for asking that. So it's become more important than looking at gray matter. Um, thank you, Dr. Choi. Uh, that is a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, we also have questions to, uh, about uh, I guess it's more of an over or overarching question related to uh, what you mentioned before about, you know, the prodromal years, you know, starting at very early age, uh, as early as seven year old. And, uh, you know, the, it seems like the onset is not going to happen until uh, early teen years. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it, is the damage coming exclusively or, you know, between in, during these prodromal years? Are the damages coming exclusively from the deficits in the pruning process, uh, or are there also something about the secondary impairment uh, from the social environmental learning during those years? Uh, you know, given their their uh, neurodiversity or atypicality, or are there both? <laughs> if I was a teacher, I would hand out a gold star for that question. <laughs> That is an amazing question. And you know what? That has to do with the uh, whether it's actually having to do with what's going on in our brains, right? Versus what you're being exposed to, such as trauma. And we know trauma, right? Trauma is actually a big risk, risk factor for schizophrenia as well. Not only are we studying that, so what's going on at the neural level, what's going on in terms of trauma, but as part of PRONET, we're also uh, studying actually it's environmental toxic exposure. So that's something that all plays a role. And sure, right now in this talk, I focused more on the neural network and neural pruning, because, you know, more about neuropsychology. But as you said, that's a great question. Don't, please don't discount the fact that there are a lot of things that are happening outside, such as trauma and toxic exposure that also play a significant role. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and uh, you know, as many of our uh, audience members are uh, uh, early career a, a neuropsychologists or psych clinical psychologists in their early early career or during, in, in the middle of their training, you know, uh, so clinical wise, you know, given the very little uh, 
uh, knowledge and th this whole testing that we are developing right now, most people are still going with, you know, by by whatever DSM is telling us to do. So are there, uh, you know, uh, what should we do if we we, we have uh, clients coming in who are demonstrating symptoms that are consistent uh, with the prodrome? So the question is, uh, what to do with with with, with a, a people who might be in the prodrome phase? Yes. Uh, so you, now that the DSM actually has APS, attenuated psychosis syndrome, which is an official diagnosis, uh, there there are again there are clinics popping up all over the country, and there are programs uh, pretty much I think in every region of the U.S. that are specifically designed to help people with. Uh, during the prodrome phase. And a lot of it has to do with different types of medications, different types of therapies. And, and uh, over and over, uh, not to discount medications or anything like that, but pro-social engagement. And that's what a lot of these programs focus on, pro-social engagement, getting them involved uh, during this vulnerable time. Because as I was mentioning, during this time, what they want to do is they want to withdraw. That's the natural thing. They, they want. They, they don't want to talk to people anymore. They want to withdraw, be in their room, uh, and just spend all their time on their phones. The, being able to get them out actually to some type of therapeutic structured pro-social engagement is key. So yeah, there are clinics throughout. And if you actually, if you look at all, uh, just I think you could just type in uh, actually clinical high risk and prodrome clinics, and you'll get a whole list of different ones that are available. Wonderful. Thank you. That is a uh, that is a good resource to have. And also, you know, given that you're talking about, you know, what is out there to help, uh, are, we also have audience members asking how, what are, uh, do you have any recommendation in terms of, you know, further reading or study resources for the professionals to learn more about this topic? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, where can I send you the whole reference list? <laughs> <laughs> You, you know what? Um, and, and if if you look, if you if you want to do that more of the academic reading, you go and actually read the writings by Scott Woods. You know, he's a professor uh, at Yale University, and he's the leader, actually, the top PR of the Psychosis Risk Outcome Network that I talked to you about. And he has made it his life's uh, career to focus on this and to help shout it out from the mountaintop about that how. Uh, this phase actually is such an important stage to focus on. So Scott Woods, any of or any papers that he has written uh, would be incredibly helpful in helping understand uh, this prodrome phase. Wonderful, Scott Scott Woods. He said. All right. Well, we actually have a lot of questions coming in. Um, so, uh, so yeah, quite supposed to pick the easy ones for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, is uh, we we have we have a couple of them mentioning about you know the the overlapping um, uh, symptoms of uh, you know this I guess this kind of early onset or early symptoms of atypicality in the way they socialize and answering questions or talking about what is going on, including the processing speed with simple tasks, and they're asking you know do you do you know anything about the over over um, e either the overshadowing of the diagnosis of autism or if there is any overlapping with autis uh, autistic Ooh. individuals. Yes, Ooh. that's uh, right here actually at the Owen Center where we work on it, Maha Asaf, she actually uh, did several, she's doing actually another R01, uh, she did several R01s trying to distinguish between schizophrenia and autism and also the onset of schizophrenia and autism. That, that again, that's another really uh, very important question that we don't know the answer to right now because you're right, there is so much overlap. And what you see actually biologically, neurobiologically, neuropsychologically, it's hard to tell. And clinically too, we, we have people who are schizophrenia with autism features or is it more autism with psychosis features? So there is a lot of phenomenological overlap we're hoping that one day the biotype studies could take a look at that and maybe kind of be able to separate that out. But right now, the, there isn't really a, a good answer about how you can separate those two out. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Jimmy Choi, for this wonderful and very informative talk. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, so uh, we will have to uh, um, end it today, but... Uh, 
in two weeks. Uh, our next uh, our next talk is coming on April first uh, uh, by Dr. Michael Brook on the topic of introduction to forensic neuropsychology practice. Um, that will be it for today. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day.